What would happen if Driver Nephi's origin story entailed him being the Lone Wanderer? Probably a lot of bad things, certainly for the Capital Wasteland. Fallout 3 is Driver Nephi, it's exactly what it sounds like. Now, how is this possible in the first place? Well, first things first, this is possible courtesy of a wonderful mod called Tale of Two Wastelands. Uh, but even if we were doing this in Fallout New Vegas, how is this possible? With the help of this wonderful little feature called Console Commands, we can make ourselves Driver Nephi, not just in terms of what we're using in combat, but we can also copy his exact special allocation, as well as his tagged skills. Well, first things first, let's get the tagged skills out of the way here. Now, Driver Nephi only has two tagged skills, and one of them is in guns, which he never uses. Not sure what the decision-making behind that was, but whatever. I figured that Unarmed would be a fair third skill because, I mean, if we have guns, then with Unarmed, we can get some pretty sweet melee perks out of the deal. Next up, we'll go ahead and console command in his apparel and weapons. Or weapon, singular. Nephi's Golf Driver. That's a pretty strong melee weapon. However, it's not the most, uh, how should we say, durable. And I'm just gonna say this right now, that if the Golf Driver breaks, which wouldn't surprise me considering how frail it is, we are allowed to use our punches as long as it's in a pinch. We can't go the whole run just using our punches. Literally, if it's just to get through a fight or finish up an area, we can punch. Other than that, we're going to try to make decisions based off what Driver Nephi would do. Now, I don't know about you, but I think this is going to be a pretty easy thing to do. Oh, and one more thing as we're going on here. The difference between special and actual is the actual takes in the perception buff we get from the Fiend's Helmet. So the one that says special is the one we actually are going with. And now, Vault 101 is pretty easily, even in Vanilla Fallout 3. But I figure since this is our first one, even if it's Tale of Two Wastelands, I'm going to go ahead and show the vault here. Super easy to get by. And if you guys would like for me to skip the little Vault 101 intro going forward, let me know, and I shall make it so. And after telling Butch to get bent and bending our golf driver over his skull, we're going to go pay Miss Ellen Deloria a visit. I like to think that she stole Driver and F.I.'s stash of vodka. You don't ever, ever touch Driver and F.I.'s personal stash. Now, one thing that's great about Tale of Two Wastelands is that in Fallout 3, as far as repair goes, it uses New Vegas' repair system. So, rather than having a cap, we can repair something to full. Just if we have a lower repair skill, it's going to take a little bit longer. While mechanically, I do prefer Fallout 3 style, for challenge videos, definitely prefer New Vegas because we can make some sweet, sweet baba caps off that. And yes, sadly, there are a couple of NPCs in Vault 101 who are considered essential, but let's just pretend we killed them on the way out. And I actually stopped here, saved the game, exited, just for you guys, because I wanted to use a mod called Fully Functional Raider Mod. It's a cool little cosmetic, link for it in the description below. But I mean, if we're going to be playing as Driver and Nephi, we have to look the part of a raider, right? Now, as we exit home sweet home for the final time in this run, first things first, we're going to head over to Megaton. Not going to go inside just yet. On the outskirts, there is a little hidden rock with a couple of items that I want. We can also take out the mole rats for some easy XP along the way. And yes, we are getting 10 XP per. Those of you who have watched some of my previous videos know that I like to take Logan's loophole. Not this time. You see, there's one more stipulation to this video. We are never allowed to cure our addictions. Ever. Because, I mean, if we're playing in character here, we have to incorporate chems and alcohol in another manner. Now, I will say with 8 Endurance, it's going to be hard to get addicted to anything, and I'm not going to go out of my way to try. However, if we do get addicted because we're allowed to use chems and alcohol, unlike in my Caesar's Legion Let's Play, that's going to be for keeps for the remainder of the run. And yes, Lucas Sim bugged for some reason. Even though he threatened to kill us, he just walks away and we can enter his house just fine as if we did take him out. Well, I'm not going to complain about that. Strength Bobblehead, Tale of Two Wastelands, rather than boosting strength by plus one, we get plus 25 to our carrying capacity. Honestly, I prefer that. Every Bobblehead in Tale of Two Wastelands has been switched to have a similar effect, which is really awesome. The Medicine Bobblehead, which you can get in James's office in Vault 101, reduces your chance to get addicted to chems by, I believe, 10%. After we do everything we want to do here in Megaton, which is mostly resupply... Talk to that wonderful gentleman in the fedora, bully this ghoul here. We're gonna go ahead and make our way to Smith Casey's garage. We're gonna skip by quite a bit of the story because I don't think Driver Nephi cares much about what goes on the Capital Wasteland, so we're not going to either. I gotta say, though, this is one of the things I really like about this game and Fallout New Vegas as well, is that if you know exactly where to go in future playthroughs, you can just go straight to it and skip a chunk of the story. 
And I figure, hey, while we're in the area, might as well partake in a bit of pest control before we head on up north, because our next destination is going to be Lamplight Caverns. Can't do much there just yet, but it's good to have it on our map for the time being. Now, those of you who watch my Faction Warriors videos know that we can travel the Mojave Wasteland for quite a while without getting into any encounters. Well, that's not quite the case here in the Capital Wasteland. As we make our way to Lamplight Caverns, we got a few super mutants to contend with. Now, Nephi's Golf Driver is pretty strong for this point in the game, but do you see the condition of our weapon? We haven't gotten into that many fights. It's pretty fragile on its own, but I did take Built to destroy that trait you can pick, which further degrades our weapon. It's kind of funny, actually. I also took Heavy Hitter, which makes you deal more melee damage, but less crit damage, so I think I kind of counteracted that, and we're left with something that just degrades faster. Oh well, that makes it more challenging. The skirmishes we just engaged in are a nice little microcosm of what this run's all about. We're super strong if we can get to what we're hitting. Not gonna be much of a problem right now, but later on once we start encountering some Enclave goons and go in Vault 87, things could be quite difficult. And hey, we might not have Georgia Boy, but Granny Sparkle is a fine alternative. How will we go about that one? Granny Sparkle? I don't know, you guys, you guys pick how we're gonna say that. Now, I didn't leave that in just to reference Georgia, but another thing I really like about Fallout 3 is that if you take out a vendor, well, you get access to their key to unlock their stash. That's pretty cool. And you gotta love Brian Wilkes here. He just saw us bludgeon a senior citizen to death. Uh, if I were Wilkes, I'd take my chances with the ants. Uh, but yeah, since we're not trying to go fast, we can take our sweet time pillaging this nice old lady shack. And you know what? I'm feeling pretty confident. We're gonna go straight to Jefferson Memorial just to see how we match up. If it turns out to be too tough for us, we'll retreat, and hey, if we clear it out early, we get some story progress done so super early as well. And if you thought we were done sacking merchants, well, get ready for this. We're doing some bizzo with this scav here. Once we're done with that, we're gonna let him go back to sleep under the pretense that we're all done here. But the last thing you want to do to a guy who looks and dresses like a raider is turn your back on him, especially when he has a bludgeoning weapon in his hand. It's kind of unfortunate that this isn't in Fallout New Vegas, but I think if it was, that it would be super easy to get by that credit check. Well, easier than it already is. And it's JMM time. First up is a couple of super mutants, and it goes about like it did as we were making our way to Lamplight Caverns. They have the potential to deal some serious damage to us, but we're just taking them out too quickly with our weapon, even if it's at about half condition. I'm just glad there are plenty of vendors in this game who can repair our gear, otherwise we'd be in quite the pickle. So the basic Super Mutants are pretty easy, gonna go ahead and cut to the Rotunda here and do battle with the Super Mutant Brute, a much tougher variant of the standard Super Mutant. And although it's not too tough for us to take out, just look at our weapon condition. Oh yeah. That has me pretty worried about Vault 87, I'm not gonna lie. Now speaking of that credit check in New Vegas, just gonna address something real fast. I have gotten a couple of comments that suggest I take the monorail to the Strip, and I do want to do that, I'm, I'm not ignoring the comments or anything. I had recorded the entirety of Faction Warriors before March 16th because my father was coming down for vacation. And he was here for about a week, and I hadn't seen him in a year, so I was pretty excited for that. And I wanted to make sure I got some content ready for you guys for the good old backlog so you guys had stuff to watch while I was away. Now, I do have a couple of FMV runs recorded already in addition to Faction Warriors, so we're not going to see them there either. But I promise you, I will try that because I want to try that myself. The only time I've ever interacted with the monorail is when I was destroying it any time I would play for Caesar's Legion. But yeah, I just thought I'd clear that up and never be shy to give me tips like that because I do appreciate it. And back to the run here, we're going to skip over Tranquility Lane. It has nothing to do with our challenge as Driver and Fi. However, if you do want me to leave this in future videos, just let me know. We can't use our Golf Driver inside of there, so that's why I'm okay with this bare-handed stipulation I addressed at the start of the challenge. Now, I gotta show you this real fast. I know that James's appearance is based loosely off of what ethnicity, hairstyle, etc. that we choose for our lone wanderer. It turns out that our Raider aesthetic also extends to James. That's pretty cool, I thought. Looks like James has fallen on some hard times, though I have to say with him imbibing chems and alcohol and looking like this, his decision making in Fallout 3's story makes a lot of sense. Taking a break from the main story, we're going to circle back to Megaton, put something on that little thing that the folks in town are worshipping, and then we're going to make our way to Tenpenny Tower. Tenpenny Tower will not only give us access to player housing and a safe place for us to rest to keep our sleep deprivation maintained, we get a whole list of vendors we can, <coughs> I mean, um, barter with. 
And most of all, Mr. Burke can pay Driver and F.I. here for a job well, well done. Now, as soon as we make our way on up to the top of the balcony, push the little red button and watch the fireworks go off. And hey, Driver and F.I. being paid 500 bottle caps to slap a fusion pulse charge onto a nuke and push a button? Yeah, I think he would do it. You can actually get up to a thousand bottle caps if you're playing as a female on Wander and use the Black Widow perk, or if you have charisma and can persuade Mr. Burke to bump up the price. We're neither of those things, but 500 easy bottle caps, yeah, we're speaking Nephi's language here. That said, we are not quite done with our business here in Tenpenny Tower, because now we have to pick a side. Tenpenny or Roy Phillips? Well, one of those two is a raider, or he might as well be, so I think that choice is obvious. And hey, it'll be cool to see Roy Phillips again. Not only was he awesome in Faction Warriors, but we did a little bit of business with him in our Caesar's Legion Let's Play. That was a lot of fun. One of these days I'll side with Tenpenny, but today is not that day. All we need to do is get a generator key, which Gustavo has. Believe it or not, this was the first try. I was prepared to save scum this until I got it, because I forgot where the other key actually is, but that wasn't the case. All that's left is to go to the generator room, and we have to pass an easy science check, which we can, courtesy of our programmer's digest. That's another thing I love about Tale of Two Wastelands. You get the skill magazines from New Vegas and the Capital Wasteland. Really helpful. We'd have to go level up and get our science to 25 at the very least, and I kind of don't want to do that, so yeah. And it turns out that Tenpenny should have hired better security guards because they stand absolutely no chance against Driver Nephi, Roy Phillips, and this pack of feral ghouls, including a couple of glowing ones. Now, for the purposes of this quest, we are allowed to equip the ghoul mask because that makes us friendly to ghouls. We won't need it anymore after this anyway, so I figure we'll go and just sell the ghoul mask when we're done here. Normally I would keep it, but this is a one-off playthrough, so there's no need to. And speaking of loot, that safe key we got off of Herbert Daring Dashwood, we get to open his safe and get a nice little handful of, um, goodies in here, including a stealth play, which we're gonna need. Well, maybe. I don't know if we'll actually need it later on. I guess time will tell. And with Tenpenny Tower successfully pillaged, raided, and taken over, let's make some progress with the main story, shall we? I've actually been quite curious to see how we measure up against the Enclaves, and going one-on-one -on -one with this upcoming goon here should give us some good insight. And right away, you can see just how much less damage we are dealing. And I mean, that makes sense, right? They are toting power armor, after all. We didn't take too much damage, although I suspect that's because we were able to beat this guy down. And now, that doesn't mean that one-on-one -on -one encounters are going to be complete freebies. Case in point here with this Enclave goon. Eh, we almost bit the dust there, and there's still plenty more for us to fight. Going up against these guys, we're definitely gonna want to utilize our melee vats whenever we can. Correct me if I'm wrong, but melee and unarmed does double damage in vats, right? We got a couple of Enclave soldiers in the main room, so we're gonna go ahead and heal up, and as we do, lo and behold, we suffer our first addiction. Now, we can offset addiction as long as we're using the chems or alcohol that our character has been addicted to, and we have plenty of those to go around. Oh, and I didn't mention this before, but if we're not allowed to cure our addictions, then using Fixer is completely out of the question. Using Fixer would completely defeat the purpose of this added layer of challenge. I find that this little stipulation stacks quite nicely with Hardcore Mode, as we already need to maintain food, H2O, and sleep. Through a bit of strategy, liberal use of our stim packs and food for healing, we end up with just one more Enclave Goon to club our way through before heading to the Rotunda. Yeah, our golf club is going to be in dire straits by the time we get out of Taft Tunnels. And hey, speaking of said tunnels, gonna go ahead and put down this last Enclave Goon, and it's tunnel time. Now, one thing that's unfortunate about this part is that the Enclave Goons who fire upon you from above, we can't fight them, so running away is the next best thing. That's not the only thing we'll be killing, though, as Dr. Lee, in her infinite wisdom, wants to bring us to a halt because some other guy needs heart medicine. And okay, fair. But I have a 10 strength. I could just hoist that dude over my shoulders and then use one hand for my club. However, I found a more practical solution. And you know what? Just in case she tries to pull this again, we're going to go after the other two guys. What are they? Alex and Daniel? Hey, I mean, Dr. Lee, you can never be too careful, honey. We gotta make sure that there's no heart problems stopping us, okay? Other than that, nothing really to show in Taft Tunnels, other than say we went through it. Now, I do want to show this part here. In all of my years playing Fallout 3, I have never in my life seen this a wander NPC with the Raider Guard Dogs. Like, who is this person? 
Do we get a terminal entry or a holotape on her or something? I really want to know because I thought this was super interesting and that Wanderer's leather armor looks real nice to wear. Fallout 3 challenges will never be boring to me because of random encounters like this and it's why I absolutely love the Capital Wasteland. I had gone that way to go to Paradise Falls so that we could gain access to the little lamplight, and of course we're taking Murder Pass to get to Vault 87. I mean, this is the Driver and F.I. run. I feel legally and morally obligated to go this way. Taking out the Super Mutants here will give us a good idea of what to expect inside of Vault 87, being that Vault 87 is absolutely infested with the darn things. And now the Super Mutants who appear inside of Murder Pass and Vault 87 are dependent on our level. Outside of a couple of instances, like Tenpenny Tower, we haven't really strayed from the main path. In fact, we cut quite a bit of the main story out earlier in the video, so our level's not too high. Still, this place poses many dangers to us. The mutants have firearms, and we don't. But what I'm really interested in is how we match up against the Super Mutant Masters. I know there's at least one here. There should be in accordance to our level. In the meantime, this Super Mutant Brute will have to suffice, and judging by our damage, that's gonna be a four-shot. Okay, it is. Cool. Uh, that weapon conditioning, uh, not liking that too much. And as we're closing in on the entrance of Vault 87, oh, this is just what the doctor ordered. Super Mutant Master. That's a super sledge, too, so we gotta be careful there. It takes a few swings, but down it goes. Not too bad. One of the reasons I didn't want to get too high leveled is at level 14 we can get Purifier, and combine that with what would be a much better melee skill, I feel like this place would be pretty easy. Well, maybe not easy, but a bit more manageable. The Super Mutants inside are a lot stronger. Now, we are a bit safe for the time being. As soon as we get inside of Vault 87, we're going to dispose of some Rad Roaches, and then it's onward to the Super Mutant Onslaught. Now, as we hit level 9, just know that at level 8, we picked Super Slam, because, I mean, for playing as a melee character, it feels obligatory to take that. And with our special allocation, we qualified for it super early on. Still, I am a little bit worried here, because our Golf Driver is at half condition. It should survive Vault 87, but I don't think we're going to be going through Raven Rock with it. Now, as we square down with the first two Super Mutants, I gotta say, this is pretty funny right here. That critical hit on that Super Mutant, I'm wondering if the trait I picked held me back, because I'm thinking that might have been a one-shot otherwise. Either that or a rapidly degrading weapon condition. I knew Built to Destroy would hinder us quite a bit because of having access to only one weapon, but I didn't think it would hinder us that much. I'm very glad I decided to go with that, and it's just a great perk to have in general. Unless you're me and offset it with Heavy Handed. I think that's the name of the trait. Now, I bring that up because you see on the bottom right-hand corner of our screen, our weapon did in fact break, and I didn't want to have to get Fox because I don't think Driver and FI would do that. But at the same time, yeah, maybe he would play upon Fox's desire to get out of there, his desperation, so why not? But this part right here was pretty funny because, like, I'm trying to get the Super Mutant Brute to come out to us so that Fox can kill it. And then Fox, for whatever reason, decides to run back for some reason. I don't know. And then he decides to just charge forward again like nothing ever happened. And then the Super Mutant Brute's rifle is turning blue. Apparently, Driver Nephi is not the only one who took Built to destroy. I'm kind of wondering if my game's gonna break before I can finish this challenge. Uh, but yeah, I mentioned Fox running away and going back, like, you see it on screen here. I barely sped this up in editing, so it's like, I'm just gonna let you take it all in, man. Uh, this run really is ripe of things I've never seen before. I've never seen the A Wanderer character before, I've never seen Fox, um, maybe he's warming up, maybe he's getting in that practice jog. He was stuck inside of that cage for a long time. Yes, I do know that it was a prisoner holding cell, but let's not be coy here. Fox was a prisoner. It's a cage, dang it. Now, as mentioned at the start of the challenge, if my weapon breaks mid-dungeon, I am allowed to go fisticuffs, but only barehanded. We deal next to no damage, but that's not really the point. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get Super Slam proc so that Fox can finish it off without being hurt too much, because you'll notice Fox's health is pretty low as well. In Tale of Two Wastelands, Fox is balanced, not nerfed, balanced. That health glitch is gone, so Fox is extremely vulnerable here. I really don't want to have to lose him. Well, at least not yet. Speaking of Fox being an intelligent super mutant and all that, you saw our special allocation at the start of the run. Isn't it weird how Driver Nephi has 4 to intelligence? Like, that's higher than Caesar. I mean, I guess that is fair, though, because Caesar, as well as Ambassador Crockett and the NCR, will forgive a courier no matter what you do to them before you enter the strip for the first time. 
And we get brought to Raven Rock, courtesy of one Colonel Autumn. Now, it's a shame that Colonel Autumn doesn't know who Driver Nephi is, because Autumn probably could get him to talk. Just get Driver Nephi a fix of whatever he asks for, and he'll probably just tell you anyway. But since Colonel Autumn does not have the benefit of metagaming on his side, we're good to go. Now, unfortunately, because our Gulf Driver broke, we're gonna have to go through this place without fighting anything. A yeah, base full of Enclave soldiers. I mean, we can flex at the upcoming officer here, who clearly is not Arch Dornan. And of course, President Eden will guarantee us safety until that's overridden. But getting through an entire base with Enclave soldiers, well, unarmed's not gonna cut it, because I don't have faith that fisting power armor is going to work. Turns out we did need that Stealth Boy from earlier. Good thing we got it. Sadly, even Stealth Boy cannot beat the powers of poor Collision. I thought that was pretty funny, too. That's okay. Time to reload that save, and we'll get it right this time. Now, because we don't have Logan's Lupa, we have to make the most of our time with this Stealth Boy. We can get to Eden if we're fast enough, and we're going to be. I always like to make a pit stop in Autumn's room, because there's a bunch of stuff you can get in here, including a bobblehead that you can only get once, ever, during any playthrough of Fallout 3. Sadly, our lockpick skill is not 50 for his footlocker, nor do we have a locksmith reader's guide. That footlocker's got some buff-out mentats and a pretty cool hollow tape. Oh, and since we had two stealth boys, if you're wondering where the other one is, I just bypassed some encounters using a stealth boy in Vault 87. Our weapon did break, as you can see, and I had to get by some of the super mutants somehow. And hey, speaking of President Eden, wouldn't you know what we're playing as the perfect character to do his little mission? I mean, it's not like Driver Nephi sticks around the Capital Wasteland anyway, if we're going off of the concept of him being the Lone Wanderer in Origin. Uh, but before we can do any of that, we have to get out of Raven Rock. And once again, we can't do any combat here because we don't have our Golf Driver. And this does not qualify as an emergency situation to go in barehanded. And even if I wanted to, we wouldn't survive anyway. And I continue to see things I've never seen before. Fox having to hunt down Enclave soldiers, and he's almost dying here. Like, will he die? Maybe he will. He has, what, like a bar of health left? It would be pretty funny for the video. And in true Driver Nephi fashion, we thank Fox by telling him to get bent and pay him back with a little something extra special. Thank you for your service, Fox. We'll see you in the next Fallout 3 challenge. Okay, so as we make our way back to the Citadel and we watch Liberty Prime get booted up, um, I'm just gonna say that I'm gonna skip right by the Liberty Prime section. We have virtually no input on what goes down anyway, and it's prone to crashing, and it did here once, which was unfortunate. However, if you want me to leave the Liberty Prime section in future videos, let me know, and I will make it so. Uh, but for now, let's get to Jefferson Memorial, where we square down against the Enclave for the second time. With our driver repaired mostly to full and ready to go, I have a pretty good feeling about this. Especially with 75 to our melee weapon skill. Ah, here's a team up you never knew you needed in your life. Driver Nephi working alongside Sarah Alliance. Something that should never be able to happen, but because you get railroaded into it in Fallout 3 anyway, that's a perfectly viable team up. Now, if we can, I'd like to be able to pull the Enclave soldiers out one by one so that we can bludgeon them while Sarah Alliance assists us. And since we have to have Sarah Lyons alongside us for the final battle, I will never ban companions from a Fallout 3 challenge. It just, it just occurred to me to bring that up because I used Fox to get through part of Vault 87. Fox in Vault 87 and Sarah Lyons here are temporary companions, so I figured that would be okay. Unlike Fox, however, Sarah Lyons doesn't make too much of a difference here because although we take quite a bit of damage from the Enclave soldiers and have to be careful, it's nothing we can't handle. I mean, look how much turbo we have in our inventory. I think we'll be all right. All said and done, there's only one more hurdle to overcome, and that's Colonel Autumn alongside a pair of Enclave soldiers. Well, let's see how this goes. Did we just Vorpal Colonel Autumn with a bludgeoning weapon? Awesome! I tell you, man, Super Slam came in super clutch the moment we got it. It made this battle, which is already pretty easy, into an absolute joke. I mean, yeah, I know it's still ongoing, but there's one Enclave Soldier left. Yeah, I think we're okay. Oh, and real fast, just gonna show you in the Pit Boy that we, in fact, never cured our addictions once in this run. We also finished this run crippled and thirsty. That feels pretty on brand for Driver Nephi. And obviously, when it comes down to it, we tell Sarah Alliance to go put in the code herself, because, well, there's no way Driver Nephi would make that sacrifice. 
And as that very conversation plays out, we have one last thing to do. That's to get that sweet juice from Colonel Autumn and stick it into the little vial there. Because a driver in FI does make his way to the Mojave Wasteland with this alternative origin story in mind. One last FU to the Capital Wasteland feels pretty in character for him. Finally, a Fallout 3 challenge where this decision makes perfect sense in character. Hope you guys had fun with that run. It was, I'll admit, easier than I thought it was going to be. Nothing was too tough. The hardest part of this challenge was trying to maintain the durability of our golf driver. That turned out to be way more of a detriment than I expected. Uh, but that's Fallout 3 in a nutshell for you. You never know what you're gonna get. You see new stuff every time you play, and I did here in this playthrough. Again, if anyone knows who A Wander is, feel free to let me know in the comments. Next up in Fallout 3, we're going to attempt to beat the game as Craig Boone, and in Fallout New Vegas, we're going to play as Colonel Autumn. See? People who stick around to the very end get access to the good stuff. Sneak peek. Thank you guys again for watching, and I'll see you at the next run.